Hop a hook a hey. Hop a hook a hey. Welcome, pilgrims. I'm going to talk to you about the Rocky Mountain fur trade and the mountain men and women and indigenous people. It starts with the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1804. And uh, they crossed the west to the mouth of the uh, Columbia River, which is in uh, Oregon, and headed back. Well, they got back about 1806. It took them about two years. There was a party in this expedition led by John Coulter and a few trappers. Well, they did not want to come back to the settlement. So before they hit St. Louis, they went back into the mountains. There was a man named Manuel Lisa, he's an entrepreneur, so he hires John Coulter and those guys to build a, fort, uh, tr uh, a fur uh, trading fort at the mouth of the Bighorn River, which is in Montana. And that was in 1809. They founded uh, the Missouri Fur Trade Company. They soon found they had competition from the Hudson's Bay Company, fur company, that was up in Canada. Also a guy by the name of John Jacob Astor, he used to have uh, 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 sent expeditions across the land, overland, and by sea. They'd come around the horn to trap over in the west. In 1822, William H. Ashby, advertised for a party of men to build a fur trading post at the mouth of the Yellowstone River on the border of Montana and North Dakota. We don't know where exactly it is. But for several years, parts of the West was closed due to the Blackfoot Indian resistance. Now how that happened, that's up on the upper Missouri. How that happened was during the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, somebody shot one of their braves, the Blackfoot braves, and they shut down the whole area. Not even Native Americans could go in there. They were called Bugs Boys because they were just bad asses. The Blackfoot Indians. But it did not determine some of the trappers, such as Jedediah Smith, Jim Bridger, Etienne Provost, and they explored the uh, Snake River area in, in Idaho and the region around the Salt Lake. Now, William H. Ashley, after pioneering the North Platte River route in Wyoming, held the first Mountain Man Rendezvous in 1825 at Henry's Fork on the Green River in Wyoming. In 1830, the Rocky Mountain Fur Company was created by Mr. Ashley. In 1835 and 1836, missionaries passed through the fur trading country and witnessed the Mountain Man Rendezvous. <laughs> the image of the hard-living, hard-drinking mountain man seizing the most of the day as best he could in the vastness of the Rocky Mountains before... A grizzler bear mauled him, or an Indian lifted his scalp. Now, the fashion fad for that period was, in the 19th century, was for the beaver top hat. Every settled, civilized gentleman in the cities of Europe and the U.S. had one or two of them. This fashion fad for beaver hats sent men trekking across the North American continent risking life and limb for the treasure trove of skins from the fat, broad-tailed rodent in the Rocky Mountains. It took fewer than 30 years to trap out the beaver, and the beaver were depleted by 1840s. One year after the last mountain man rendezvous in 1843, the first wagon trains passed over the Oregon Trail. In 1848, gold was discovered in California, and half the world flooded to the west. 
By the 1850s, the silk hat became the fashion. And so, bye-bye for the need for beaver. Life in the mountains was not easy as a trapper. I mean, you want to catch a beaver? Be prepared to spend hours wading in the freezing discomfort of streams and rivers. And ears alert for sounds of the enemy. Oh, suffer a flesh wound. Well now, <laughs> cauterize it with a red-hot barrel of your weapon. Your barrel will be gone. Run out of food? <laughs> On a long trek looking for the better beaver grounds? Eat your moccasins or moose turd pie. And I'll tell you about that later. Oh, or spend, uh, try to find, able to find water a day after hellish day in the desert, somewhere near. Just sit down and die. That's what they done. Trappers were exploited also. Some lived free and easy lives, but others owed their soul to the company store. Once a year, the trappers gathered at a preordained place in the mountains to turn over their plues. Plues are a name they gave to pelts. To their employers. In return, they got such necessities as gunpowder, shot, a line of credit, that they often boozed or hoard away in a few days in, in uh, unblazing debauchery. <laughs> Whereby the head throbbing, with head throbbing, the trapper starts to spend the next year working off his debt with memories of his companions and the glow of the next rendezvous 12 months hence. That is, if in the mountains... He wasn't shot, axed, trampled, frozen, drowned, uh, ripped apart by a grizzly bear. It is said that the trapper led the march of civilization to the west, from Canada in the north, California in the south, Mississippi River in the east, to the Pacific in the west. Every river, every stream, uh, was uh, visited and inspected thoroughly by the trappers. Always exposed to constant danger from hostile Indians, extreme hunger and cold, they penetrated the wilderness in all directions in pursuit of the almighty beaver. I'm gonna, never mind, I won't say that. Now, how to trap a beaver. Okay, the beaver has an oil sack near its anus. The trapper takes the castorium from this sack and uses it as bait. The beaver uses this oil to oil himself to attract other beavers. The trapper would take a branch of willow, strip off the bark, and wash it thoroughly. Then... He would uh, put the oil on it and uh, attach it to the trap, which floats above, and, and, and the, the, the stick would float above the trap. And when the beaver was attracted by the smell, it would approach, and if it's caught in its struggle, it usually drowns. That's how they used to trap beaver. Now, the price of a beaver pelt. The weight of a pelt is about three pounds. Now, I have one here. This is a winter pelt. You can see how beautiful that is. And that weighs about anywhere from two and a half to three pounds. And that's what everybody was after. Now, the trapper of the fur companies that belonged to fur companies would be paid about anywhere from $1.50 to $2 per pelt each. Now, the free trapper, this was a guy not attached to one of the fur companies, he would get about $5 to $6 each. And there was a difference. Okay. Now, starting out for the hunt, the trapper had his needs. One, a horse to ride. Two, a mule to pack. 
six five to six traps in a in a trap sack, ammunition for his rifle, a few pounds of tobacco, a supply of moccasins, his rifle, bowie knife, tomahawk, and over his shoulder he had uh, the powder horn which carried his powder. Over the other shoulder, a possible bag where he had sundry things like old char cloth, uh, uh, patches, flint and steel, and sundry other foofaras to trade with beads and vermilion and such things. Okay, and now we go from that to famous mountain. Men. Now, after Daniel Boone, <laughs> Kit Carson was uh, renowned as the first real one to go pet into the wilderness out there. But he, Jim Bridger, Jedediah Smith, Milton Sublet, Bill Williams, Hugh Glass, Pegleg Smith, Old Gabe, and there were two African American trappers that a lot of people don't know about. One guy was named Ed Rose. He was. There's not much written about him, so I don't have much on him. But the other, everybody knows, James P. Beckworth. Well, now, James Beckworth was accepted into the uh, Crow tribe as a lost cousin. They thought he was a lost cousin, so they adopted him. And he lived with them for many, many years, made uh, a lot of uh, trades with the uh, mountain men, and they thought he was magic. The uh, tribes. Anyway, another bit of uh, trivia: Jim Beckworth was the founding father of Pueblo, Colorado. Oh yeah, Jim Beckworth, black man. <laughs> the indigenous people. Now, in the Upper Missouri River tribes, there was the Sioux, the Yankton, Teton, Yanktonai, Hidatsa. Mandan Arikara, and these guys were always in touch with these guys. On the Messershell River, these tribes, the Assiniboine and the Crow were along the, uh, the Yellow River area, the Grovant and the Blackfoot in the Upper Missouri River. In the Columbia River tribes, there was the Flatheads and the Nez Perce. The Snake River tribes, there was the Bannock, the Shoshone, and the Northern Paiute. On the North and South Platte River area, the tribes were the Missouri, the Otto, the Iowa, Omaha, Pawnee, Ponca, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Ute, Mountain Utes, and the Shoshone. Large group. Now, along the Colorado River and, and Arkansas River tribes, there was the Osage, the uh, Navajo, the Hickory Apache, the Kiowa, and the Kiowa Apache. Now, on the Red River uh, route, and the tribes were the Mescalero Apache and the Comanche. And those were the uh, tribes that most of the mountain men came in contact with. Food that they ate. What was their basic food? Their main diet was what? Meat. You know, buffalo, elk, deer, rabbit, fish, birds, beaver tail, marmot, whatever it had, four legs, or could fly. Now, the other thing they ate was commissary. There, DJ. Uh, the camas root was a staple of the indigenous peoples of this area. And uh, I'll explain that in a minute. The other thing they ate were bordines. You know what bordines are? I'll explain that. And of course, when you're down and out and starving to death, moose turd pie. I'll explain that. Camas root, the staple of Native Americans, was it grew like a turnip. And it was white, and they would cook it like the, it was mostly the women that did the cooking anyway. They dug a pit about three feet deep and put sticks of fire to, to burn there for at least 10 hours. On top of the, the wood, they put the rocks. On top of the rocks, they put grasses and leaves 
and on top of the leaves and they put the camas root, the bushels of camas root. On top of the camas root, they put more leaves and cover it up with sod. And they'd let that burn for 10 to 15 hours. Well, the camas root was white when it went in to cook. When it was finally cooked, it was turned black and had a taste a little bit like licorice, but highly nutritious, really nutritious, and a staple of the indigenous people. So a lot of the mountain men ate that. Bardines. Well, not a lot of people know about Bardines. Well, Bardines was right after a buffalo hunt, they'd take the intestine, which could be 20 feet long. And they'd strip it out, turn it inside out, clean it real good, and take the prime meat, like the back strap, the uh, rib, rib uh, meat and the hump meat, season it, stuff it in them bodines, cook it over an open fire, and serve it on a blanket. That was bodines. Or in other words, sausage. <laughs> okay. Now here's a little trivia you might know or not know about. Mount Rushmore. Now, the early plans for Mount Rushmore was for mountain men instead of what they have now, but because they were the, uh, you know, lead march into the West. They had picked Kit Carson, John Coulter, and Jim Bridger. Well, the boosters of the plan, <laughs> shelved them because these guys were not only brutal to the environment, brutal to the Native Americans, but brutal to themselves, and they could not immortalize them in a rocky <laughs> little mountain. So that's what changed all of that. But they, facts be known, truth be told, they were the first ones to be uh, picked for the mountain. Okay. Mountain women. There were mountain women, by God. Most of the women of the trappers were bought and traded for. You know, most of the women were Native American. And uh, the going price was 600 bucks. And at that time, that was a lot of money. Or one horse. In those days, a gun cost 100 bucks each. A blanket, $40. They were usually Hudson Bay blankets, big wool blankets. Red flannel was $20 a yard. How about that, huh? Alcohol. <laughs> that was $64 a gallon. Now, tobacco, beads, vermilion, other sundry boofarize, we call it, could go in with the, uh, the corresponding price and still trading by a woman. The Native Americans loved having the trappers in their tribe because they had access to all the spoof rush, sugar, coffee, uh, ammunition, guns, knives. So they were glad to have most of them, except for the Bugs Boys. Who were they? The Blackfoot. Now the Mountain Man's post office, they had a post office, believe it or not. Here you are out in the mountains, whereabouts, trapping away. How do you know what's going on? Well, there's a place called Independence Rock in Wyoming, where messages were written on this rock with buffalo grease and black powder. Now everybody passes going west into the Rockies, so it was a good spot to leave a message for where the next rendezvous would be. Rendezvous from 1825 was the first one. The last one was in 1843. There were 10 of them in Wyoming. Uh, on the Popo Aggie, there was one time, and on the Green River, several times. Four of them were in Utah, on the Willow Valley area in Utah, and only one in Idaho, Pierre's Hole. Anyway, this is how they knew where the next rendezvous was going to be. Now, why was the rendezvous so important? Well, Mountain Man didn't want to go spend 70 days back traveling back to Missouri to trade his beaver, so these fur companies would come into the run and create a rendezvous. 
tons of whiskey. Get them drunk as hell. They could buy a shot, you know, sugar, all their needs and necessities. And then get drunk as hell. They didn't have to worry about being out there and somebody, some enemy ready to take his head off. So that's what the rendezvous was all about. Now, we talk about the modern day rendezvous. I belong to the East River Free Trappers. We have our annual rendezvous up here in Washington Gulch on the last weekend in July, the first weekend in August. Now, what is it all about? It's about to teach the history of the fur trade in modern day times. There are black powder shoots, bone arrow shoots, tomahawk and knife throwing contests. There's uh, making fire with flint and steel, uh, storytelling, name giving, and trading for things you need with others. And the teepee creepers. <laughs> oh, you don't know what that is? You come to the rendezvous, you'll find out what a teepee creeper is. Anyway, most of all, it was good all-American fun. Now, here's the kind of fun we had. We had a rendezvous one year, the family of the Moncrief family down in Gunnison. Their daughter was getting married, so they had the ceremony up here on uh, in Paradise Warming House, where they held the, the ceremony. We were having our rendezvous at the exact same time. What we didn't know was that a very good friend of the Moncrief's was the President of the United States, George Bush, senior and junior, and they were up there. We didn't know that. Well, ironically enough, Charlie Kerpow from Ohio, one of the trappers, brought a, a three-inch cannon he had shot it and it cracked, so he wanted to blow it up. He said, well, I'll bring it to the run. He would blow it up. You know, facts be known, truth be told. We buried that cannon right down to the bedrock, about three feet, packed it with mud, cow poop, and, and skunk cabbage, put about three-quarters of a pound of 3F powder in it, and set that thing off. Well, before we set it off, we sent a guy into town to see if he could hear it when it went off. At high noon, we set that thing off, and I got it. Boom! It was a three on the Richter scale. I mean, the trucks that were above moved back. Holy guacamole. Well, the end result was we sent that cannon three inches into the bedrock. And not a damn thing happened with the crack. And believe it or not. But they heard it all the way down in... <laughs> <laughs> down the valley there. Well, two days later, I'm driving, I was driving the bus then. I was driving the bus and explaining what we did with this cannon. Some guy in the back said, what? That's what that was? Holy smoke. Did you know what happened? When that thing went off, they put the, the Bush family and the Moncrief in the cooler up there <laughs> in Paradise Warming House and laid on them. They had snipers in the trees. They shut off the road up to the mountain. Well, we had noticed there were like three of these black Humvees come by after we blew that cannon up. We didn't think anything of it. Thought it might have been, uh, you know, the police, but we didn't think very much of it. Anyhow, that's what happened. The East River Free Trappers blew up a cannon and put the President of the United States in the cooler up in Paradise Warming House. Yo, ha, ha, ha. Ain't nobody else can say that. Anyway, that's some of the fun we have. These are some of the people that I came in contact with in 30 days of being in the rendezvous. There's the names they were given. And everybody gets a name when they're in the, in the camp because of something they did. Romolo. Buffalo Bull, Gray Buffalo Bull, Badger Breath, Long in the Water, Tato, Woodman, Trapper Owl, Trapper Red, Boom, Bam, Bam, Brass Turtle, Sack Rat, Trapper Sacket, Mugandi, <laughs> Elkhart, that's me, uh, uh, Spotted Muskrat, Smoking Bones, Double Load Smoke, now how he got that name? 
He forgot he had loaded his gun, didn't clean it, and put another load in there, about split his head open when he shot it. Anyway, uh, here we go, more, uh, more powder. He almost blew his arm off for putting too much powder in his gun. Uh, <laughs> things like that happen. Yet, there's a kid that comes to every rendezvous and every rendezvous. He is so behaved, we have yet to give him a name. Well, we call him Yet. <laughs> Things like that. Broken tip, bell woman, whiskey woman, six feathers. Now, remember this name, six feathers, okay? Because I got another story before we end this. Spoons, many paws. She didn't like that name, but... She had this coat that had a lot of paws on, so it was, hey, many paws. That's how you get your name, you know. Uh, bead woman, fawn, rings the bell. Sean Lee, thunder and lightning, and many, many, many more. Different names. And that's pretty much what happens at the run. We have nothing but fun. For more information, by the way, on dates, times, names, and stories, the book, A Rendezvous Reader, Tall, Tangled, and True Tales of the Mountain Men from 1805 to 1850. Edited by John, uh, James H. McGuire, Peter Wilde, and Donald A. Barkley. Now, I've got one more story before we go. We're at the rendezvous, and boy, one day this lady by the name of Six Feathers walked in the camp. My God, in this white, beautiful white buffalo dress, and she had with her that most beautiful ass you ever saw. I, I'm an ass man. I love ass. Now, don't be offended now. Wait a minute. Everybody in camp was looking at her ass. I mean, it just looked so good. And they knew I was an ass man. It's tough. You got to go say something to this lady. So after drinking a few <laughs> jokes or shit, I went over and said, you know what? Six, six feathers. I would love to kiss your ass. She pulled out her green river knife and <laughs> said, get away from me. I kiss my own ass. Nobody kisses my ass but me. So how the hell you do that? So you go get everybody a little, gather them around, get a camera so you can prove it. I'll show you how I kiss my own ass. Well, by God, we gathered around, and sure enough, lo and behold, <laughs> Six Feathers kissed her own ass in front of everybody, and we documented it. Now, I hope you're not offended, anybody, but here's a picture of Six Spoons kissing her ass. Ah, <laughs> gotcha. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to say adios. Watch a top knot. Keep your powder dry. Ah. East River Free Trappers in 93, 98. This is what they gave out. This is what you use to, um, when you, right there by where the uh, flint hits the, the frizzing, it starts a spark to the powder. There's a hole that goes into the barrel. Sometimes that gets clogged. Well, you gotta have a needle. <laughs>
That you use for everything, except for one thing, one more knife you need to see, and that's your scalper. You pull this guy out, if I can get him. Come here. This was a, Dam a Damascus knife. Damascus meaning it was layers of steel. Never did get, uh, it's, stay sharp really long. Really dependable knife. And that's buffalo horn for the handle. It was invented in Pennsylvania, so it's really a Pennsylvania rifle. You notice it's a flintlock. And the mountain men, when they came out with the Hawking rifle, which is a smaller barrel, and they used uh, caps to ignite them. Well, sometimes the caps would get wet, sometimes they <laughs> just wouldn't go off. And they said, fuck them, they went back to the the old trusty, the flintlock. Turd pie. Well, now you're starving to death. <laughs> Anything edible is good. Well, you take the moose. The moose is a vegetarian. I mean, he eats good veggies and berries and stuff. And boy, if you're starving to death, you look through that turd. There's berries and things that haven't been devoured. You just boil them up, and you got yourself some moose turd pie and save your life. Oh, 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 oh,